you so much. How many of you know that the Bible says that the way we approach God is with thanksgiving? He said that you, you know, you walk up to the picket fence of heaven and you open the gate, but the way you open the gate, you enter his gates with thanksgiving, and then you come into his courts with your praise on. Amen? And so uh, God basically is saying, do not come up in here if you don't know, if you can't find something to thank me about. Like, leave all of your complaining outside of my gate. If you're going to come in my gate, you better get your thanksgiving on. And then if you want this to keep on going, you got to get your praise on. And, and how many know you can't praise somebody that you're not thankful for? I can't get no help from Jubilee. What, what did, did you have to think? Of, okay, now watch. So, so what's important is that we understand that the approach that we have with God is, he said, leave your negativity outside of my presence. You got to get thankful. The reason why we have difficulty in our lives and in our relationships is when we lose our thanksgiving for one another, our thankfulness for one another, because we're created in God's image. And if the way we approach God is with thanksgiving, then we have to understand that we need to approach one another with thanksgiving. See, the, most of the trouble in our relationships is, uh, you, listen, wives, you're going to get in trouble if all you're doing is punctuating what your husband's not doing and lose your thanks, thankfulness for what he is doing. Now, I, I'm going to go over here where the thankful women are. Come on, somebody. And see, uh, or, or men, you know you're going to get in trouble if all you're doing is pointing out what your wife isn't doing rather than being thankful for what she is doing. It's the beginning of a demonic conversation. You cannot have a conversation with the enemy and be thankful at the same time. Because now listen now, Thanksgiving is the place of spiritual immunity to demonic activity. You cannot have your praise on and listen into a conversation you're having with the adversary simultaneously. You either got to pay attention to his lies or you got to get happy about what God has done for you and what people are for you and to you. Amen? So this is where we get messed up. And, and then we'll even, we'll even uh, get so messed up about it that we'll start focusing on what God isn't doing for us. Like, where's my husband at, God? I'm going to have to go back over here now. I felt that over there. You know, where's my husband at? Where's my wife at? Where's my money at? Where's my healing at? Where's my breakthrough at? Where, hey, hey. Hey, Jesus, I've been serving you my whole life. You can't even give me a husband. You can't give me some money. You can't heal this. You can't cast that five pounds I've been trying to lose for five years out of my behind. Come on, Jesus, can you help a brother out? Come on. You know how to, and then we focus on what God is not doing. Amen? So how many of us are thankful for our pastor? Come on, somebody, Pastor Dick Burnell. The way we approach our man of God, the way we approach our man of God isn't by pointing out the stuff that he's not doing. It's by celebrating the things that he is doing. Amen? It's the God deposit on the inside of him. I mean, he's obviously extraordinarily wise, at least in his, uh, at least in his selections of guest speakers. <laughs> he knows what's up. What I say, I'm just saying. Okay, so, huh. if God needs to be appreciated, then our pastor needs to be appreciated. And then that, that is how we treat one another. That's how we roll with one another. So this morning, with that being said, I want to uh, do a two-part series. I'm going to do part one this morning and part two this evening. I'll be here tonight at 6 o'clock 
in the urgency building. I can't remember the last time I did a Sunday night service, but I just guess pastor wants to work me out this weekend. Amen. Because like you preach two services and then why don't you just slip in that volunteer rally and then while you at that, before you can even catch your breath, preach to everybody and then come on back on Wednesday. Praise the Lord. I'm like, all right. And last time I checked, <laughs> I ain't mad. I ain't mad. I could be sitting home doing nothing. But, but last time I checked, I'm going to be 60 years old in August. So I know everything's going, it's just doing different things. My body's doing different things. Like everything's dropping. Come on, somebody. It's like I actually have some spanks on under this outfit. Come on, just holding everything in and everything up. Uh, oh, you think I'm lying. I'm like... If I'm lying, I'm dying. Like, the other day I was in the restroom in the, getting ready for church, and, and my wife yelled from the, from the bedroom that you could see into our, rest, our, our bathroom from our bedroom, and she said, hey, uh -huh. women are visual too. <laughs> I'm like, what's going on? Shut the door. <laughs> I'm telling the truth. Amen. It just is weird. It's weird when you're 60. I've been on the planet for 60 years. You know, I've seen them come and I've seen them go. I've seen them come and I've seen them stay too. Amen? And it's better to stay than to go. Amen? So tonight, tonight I'm going to do part two of uh, this message, but I want to uh, just break off some preliminary, I've never done this before here. I usually study and prepare and get my thing all dialed in, but Sean takes so doggone long that you can't preach a whole message after he makes the announcements, amen. You all witnessed him in his blue suit longer than you're going to hear the anointment. <laughs> but since I'm his mentor, I can say this stuff, amen. Hey Amen. You think I'm kidding. I'm going to light that brother up. Be like, you can tell me the truth. I'm about to tell you the truth when we get in the green room. <laughs> You're going to have some truth. Hey Amen. I'm going to have Sarah sitting there. Amen in it too. Hey, praise the Lord. Okay, so everybody say, keep the main thing. The main thing. See, what happens, and I, I am playing. I love Sean, and I'm, I'm very proud of them, and uh, I, I'm, I'm just playing. And you can tell when you have a relationship with somebody, you can make fun of them. Amen? Okay, but I ain't making fun of you, man. I'm telling the truth. You talk too long. <laughs> Pastor flew me all the way up here so y'all could listen to Sean. Come on, somebody. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop now. Okay, so how many of you know, you, did I mention that you took too long this morning? Okay, so... So what happens many times in our life is we receive the Lord and then we use our exertion on sideways energy or we use our attention on looking back. And many times when we are exerting sideways or looking back, we lose sight and focus on what our eyes are supposed to be fixed on. And then when, we're, and then when you're, you're trying to move forward by looking back or looking sideways, it, you crash into something. It never works out. Things don't turn out the way that you want them to turn out. So, so here what happens when we get in that disposition, and then tonight I'm going to talk about the, the five mindsets that distract us from the main thing. You're not going to want to miss that tonight. But look at Hebrews chapter 12. Look at verse 1. It says, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Now look at me for a minute. What he's basically saying, the writer of Hebrews is basically jumping off into the reality, and he's saying this. this you're not the first people that had ever been through something. He said, if you just take inventory of the cloud of witnesses that are around you that God has come through for, you wouldn't have so much trouble believing for yourself. So if he said, if you just look back and understand that God is good all the time because God is God all the time. The reason why God is good all the time is because God's good and he's God all the time. Look at me. God's goodness to you is not based on you being good. Amen. I'm going to go over here. God's goodness to you isn't based on you being good. It's just who he is. He's good. God is good. How often? All the time. Why? Because he's God all the time. And God is good. Now, you, on the other hand, 
Me, on the other hand, we go in and out, don't we? We go up and down. We have highs and lows. Aren't you so glad that God's goodness is not connected to your goodness? In fact, sometimes God has been the best to me when I've been the worst to him. You and I have been taught too long, too many years, that our performance is attached to God releasing his good. But while we were at our worst, he demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, he sent Jesus to die for us when we weren't any good. And so God's goodness is what made us righteous, not our performance. Who has bewitched us thinking that what began as a work of the spirit is going to be accomplished as, as the result of a work of the flesh? So listen, if you just look back, there's a cloud of witnesses that have made it through their difficulty because God is good. Listen, 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 listen. All God wants is to be believed. He doesn't want your performance. He had that in Jesus. God doesn't look at your performance. He looks at Jesus' performance when he makes a decision about you. He doesn't look at you and say, I'm going to bless you, be good. You haven't been good. I'm not going to bless you. Uh, no way. Okay, he's not doing that. He looks at Jesus and he makes a decision about you. Why? Because you're dead. And your life is hidden with God in Christ. I don't know about y'all, but dead means dead. So if I'm dead, God is not measuring anything by my performance. He's measuring everything by, by my believing in Christ's performance. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. This messes us up. We think I put my right foot in, I take my right foot out, I put my right foot in, and then I shake it all up. No, that's not how we do Christianity. We are joined with him. Listen, you are as much a branch as he is the vine. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. No, we know he's the vine, but we go in and out of being the branches. No, you're the branch. Quiet over here. I'm going to go over here where there's some shouting. How do you think, how do you think you're a vine, then you're a branch, then you're not a branch. I'm a branch, I'm not a branch. I'm not a branch, I'm not a branch. You're completing him. I'm incompleting him. I'm completing him. I'm, I'm righteous. I'm unrighteous. What do you think God's schizophrenic? <laughs> you think he's got Alzheimer's? What, I forgot. No. no. If, if Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for you, that you might become the righteousness of God in him. Wait a minute. How do you become and then unbecome? How do you become and now you're not and now you are, now you ain't, now you is, now you was, and wait, wait, wait. You either are the righteousness of God. Listen, this is what we think. This is the problem. We think that our performance is what releases God's hand. It's not our performance. It's our belief in his performance. The problem comes when we make our Christ following about us and not about him. You're invited to the table, but you bring nothing to the table. What you going to bring? Your righteousness? The Bible says your righteousness is like filthy rags. You going to bring filthy rags to the table? No. His righteousness is what makes you right with him. You can't go in and out of being right with him. Your believing of it... You attach your belief to it, that's what causes you to experience it. You don't experience the goodness of God till you first attach your belief to the goodness of God. It's not your goodness, it's just you believing in his goodness. Are you following me? It's all, all God wants is to be believed. Remember the Pharisees go up to Jesus, how do we work the works of God? Jesus goes, what? You don't work the works of God. God works for you. You don't work. It's both it, he wills and works for his good pleasure in us. He who began a good work in you will com complete the work. You don't complete the work that he started. What are you talking about? 
You don't work this thing. He began a work. And he's going to finish the work that he began. All he wants you to do is rest in the fact that he's working. What? You don't have anything to do with this except believe. Everybody say, how I believe believe. is how I behave. behave. So we all focus on the behavior. God doesn't tell you to behave. He tells you to believe, and then you'll automatically behave. See, we like behave, 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 behave. Jesus is like, how do we work the works of God? Believe. He told the Pharisee, you don't work nothing. You believe that I'm working. You all all right? Okay, so, so here the Bible says, since we have, put that Hebrews back up there, Hebrews 12. Since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight, encumbrance, weight, and sin that so easily entangles us. Look at me. What the Bible says is basically we are not manufactured by God to live our life weighed down or tripped up. He said, but it's your responsibility to eliminate sideways exertion and backward focus. Let us run the race with endurance that's set before us. How do you run the race with endurance? The word endurance means the ability and the capacity to continually bear up in our believing, not with a passive complacency, but with a hopeful fortitude that actively resists weariness and defeat. So here he's saying, this is, the way, this is what you gotta do. You gotta lay aside the sin and the weight. The weight is that you're carrying what you were not created to carry. Amen. Wow. Take my yoke on you because it's easy and light. Why? Because we are only able to do what's easy and light, not complicated and heavy. When it's complicated and heavy, how many know we all toe up? Our relationships start falling apart. We can't sleep at night. We, it gets crazy. We have to go drive by Krispy Kreme when the light's on and eat a dozen. I ain't mad at nobody. What are you doing? I'm going to Krispy Kreme. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. I know I'm going to get my dozen. Six with chocolate, six without. I'm going to do that. Don't ask me how I know about this. (sighs) So we're not created to carry the weight. So here he says, let's lay aside the weight. How do we lay aside the weight? Cast your care upon me because I care for you. You got to believe that he's taking it. No, we give it to him, take it back. Give it to him, take it back. Give it to him, take it back. I got that crazy kid. How many of y'all got crazy kids? Don't raise your hand. I can tell by looking because your eye, one eye is going like that. (laughs) Crazy kids are crazy. And then you try to correct them. They're like, I didn't ask to be born. You got seven kids. You got another one coming. Have you lost your mind? Did your pea brain fall out of your ear when you were sleeping? Just rolled out, boop, and your wife sticks it in in the morning. Like, seven kids? This brother got, like, a basketball team and a bench. (laughs) So... (laughs) So, so our kids, man, you like, you try to correct me, like, I didn't ask to be born. You didn't ask to be born? Well, then let me kill you right now. (laughs) No, I always, and my kids used to say that, I didn't ask to be born. And I always said, if I knew it was going to be you, I wouldn't have had no kids. (laughs) Didn't ask to be born. I heard my wife singing in the bathroom the other day. Someday my prince will come. I'm like, hey, what about me? (laughs) Someday my prince will come. And she was like running through the house in a tutu. I'm like, what? Who who, 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 who are you waiting for? (laughs) Someday. I'm here. She said, you got doggone Thousand Island dressing on that wife beater, man. You better change up. Put your clean wife beater on. Come on, somebody. Okay, so the Bible tells us how, how to eliminate, how to eliminate the weight and the sin. The sin, the sin is what I call the misses that create messes. So whenever there's a mess in your life, you could trace it back to a miss in your life. And the Bible says lay aside that miss 
so you don't have so many messes. The reason why your marriage is a mess, the reason why your money's a mess, the reason why your mind's a mess, the re reason why your hair's a mess, come on somebody, the reason why the house is a mess, the reason why the car's a mess, the reason why your soul is a mess is because you have calibrated and attached your belief to a miss. And you got distracted by the miss and you believe the miss and the miss created a mess. Y'all all right? Look at the next verse. So it says, run the race with endurance. And then it says, this is how you, this is how you lay aside the weight. This is how you get rid of the sin. This is how you run the race. Fix your eyes on Jesus. <laughs> fix your eyes on Jesus. Now, who's the Jesus? Jesus, fix your eyes on Jesus. Yeah, he's not the author and perfecter of your faith. He's the author and perfecter of faith. Amen. So let me mess you up. This is not, your Christianity is not about you. It doesn't say fix your eyes on you. Take an examination of you. Last time I checked, the Apostle Paul said, examine yourselves and see if you're in the faith. So you don't get disqualified. He didn't say make sure you're in your faith. He said make sure you're in the faith. Jesus is, in the, is the author and perfecter of faith. In other words, I'm going to get letters about this. I don't care. I'm right about it. God doesn't, isn't interested in your faith. You got cancer because of you didn't have enough faith. No, it's not your faith. It's your faith in his faith. I believe because he believed in me. My believing in him doesn't cause him to believe in me. He already believed in me. He already had faith in me. He already saw me before the foundations of the world were created. He already formed me in my mother's womb. He believed in me. I have to believe that he believed in me. I believe that his... Listen, listen, listen. Is God logical? Yes. God has logic. Now, it doesn't match our logic. But you, Juanita, are... Let me say it like this. You make sense to God. He looks at Juanita and goes, that makes sense. Now, you might not make sense to nobody on this row. <laughs> but to God, this is logical. Now, what we have to understand is that we believe that God believes in us. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not your faith. It's his faith towards you that you believe in. Why do you think it's so ironic when people go, I felt so good because they just believed in me? Because that's what God does. He believes in you. You don't have nothing to do with this. He has everything to do with this. All you have to do is believe. Now, well, let me watch. Let, let, me, let me continue to do this. So who is Jesus? What's this Jesus guy? Who is this person? Who's the, the Jesus that, that we're fixing our eyes on? He, Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, he sat down, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Bible says that the throne of God is the throne of grace. Y'all all right? Just stick with me. I got just 12 minutes, but, but I got to get this. If you get this, it'll change your life. No more weight, no more sin, no more shame. Here it says, Draw near with confidence and boldness to the throne of grace. If it was a throne of judgment, we wouldn't have confidence and boldness. So we know it's a, it's a place of grace. It's a throne of grace. So we can receive. Everybody say receive. So we can receive mercy and find grace in times of need. Listen, remember when Jesus is, is about to wash the disciples' feet. This isn't in my notes, but let me just say this to you. And remember, Jesus is sitting at the table, and the Bible says he realized that it was his time to go. And he realized that God had put everything into his hands. And he realized that it was time to take everything that God put into his hands into the hands of his people. 
And the Bible says, so after he realized that, he girded about himself with a, with a towel and he sat down and he started washing the disciples' feet. And when he came to Peter, Peter said, you ain't washing my feet. I'm washing your feet. And Jesus said, now let me just say this. If, if I went over and took Sean's shoes off and started washing his feet, it would require more generosity and humility for him to receive from his mentor, one of his mentors washing his feet, than it would for me to be sitting there and him wash my feet. It takes more humility to let a mentor minister to you. Let me just say it like this. It takes generosity to receive what I'm trying to do. So watch this. So he comes up to Peter and he says, hey, let me wash your feet. Peter said, you ain't washing my feet. I'm washing your feet. And then Jesus said, Peter said, you're not receive, I'm not receiving from you. You're receiving from me. I'm not going to receive from you. I'm going to work for you. I'm gonna, you sit down, Jesus. I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to work for you. I'm going to do, do this. And Jesus said, what I'm doing right now, you don't understand. You're going to get it later. But if you don't learn how to receive, you got nothing to do with me. Wow. And see, the whole thing, we think we got to do for Jesus, do for Jesus, do for Jesus, do for Jesus. Jesus says, sit down and enter into my rest. The book of Hebrews says labor to enter into his rest. It's work for you to not work. The work is I got to do something, I got to do something, I got to do something. Because our flesh repels grace. Grace does not make sense to our flesh. Why? Because we don't get any kudos. We don't get any credit. We don't get a gold star for being a great Christian. Come on, somebody. We, but God, you, you, you don't get any more credit for what God is doing in your life. It doesn't have nothing to do with you. All you need to do is believe and receive. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive. Not believe and work, believe and receive, and then you'll have them. Stop working so hard. Rest, man. Rest. Pray that it's blessed. And take, Jesus will take care of the rest. Does this make sense to you? Okay, now. <laughs> so here. What? Oh, okay, I will. I'm trying. Shoot. I mean, I, I didn't know we were having a conversation, but I'll talk to you after. But I usually work alone, but I am encouraged by that. No, I'm not kidding. That was precious. So the Bible says, 1 Peter 1, 13. Y'all all right? You doing all right? You're looking at me like, wow, this man been smoking something cray cray. 1 Peter 1, 13, it says, therefore, prepare your minds to take action. Stay sober in your spirit, small s, that's your human spirit. In other words, do not mix your human spirit with inferior contemplations, with things that will dumb down the work of Christ. Stay sober. Get ready to take action. Why? Because how I believe is how I behave. And then it says, then fix your hope completely on the grace you know what that word completely means? Everything. <laughs> There's no room for the introduction of you. God's grace is grace. He said, fix your hope completely on the grace that's brought to you when you get a glimpse of who Jesus is for real. A revelation of Jesus is a revelation of grace. Why? Because Jesus is the personification of God's grace to the human race. It's by grace that you've been saved, lest any man should boast. It's a gift from God. The gifts and calls of God are irrevocable, starting with grace. You want to reign in life? Receive the gift of righteousness and the abundance of life, abundance of, of grace, gift of righteousness, abundance of grace. You reign in life, the Bible says. It doesn't say you work hard, you're smart, you're the greatest Christian that's ever walked. No, you believe and receive, and then you shall have. Why? Because Jesus is the personification of God's grace. Titus 2.11, listen. <laughs> 
Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation. How did it appear? It was Jesus. The grace of God appeared. Who's the grace of God? Jesus. Grace is not a subject. It's a person. Watch, 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 watch. First John, I mean, John 1, verses 1 and 2. Watch this. Oh, I'm running out of time, and y'all leave. I could be raising someone from the dead in the back row. Be like, I got to go get my Denny's combo. <laughs> okay, I'm going to hurry, though. I'm hurrying. So it says, in the beginning was the word. Everybody say the word. word. Now, what, wait. Juanita, why was the word in the beginning? In the beginning was the word. Why wasn't in the beginning the law? Why wasn't in the beginning the works? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 2. Stay with me. Stay with me. I'm going to mess you up. He was in the beginning with God, the word. Verse 14. And then the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Look at me. What was Jesus full of? Grace. So grace must be true. Amen. It's full of grace and truth. So, in the beginning was the word. So words become sentences. Become, become paragraphs. Become conversations. So Jesus, you're going to want to write this down. Jesus is God's personification of God's conversation about you. Does God want to bless me? I don't know. Let's look at Jesus. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. I came to give you life and life more abundantly. I became poor so you could become rich. There's your answer. Does God want to heal me? Well, let me look. God's conversation is the personification of Jesus, who is grace. Does God want to heal me? Mm, by his stripes, I'm healed. Well, there you go. That's God's conversation. Does God, is God mad at me? No, God's mad about you. How do you know? Because this is love. I came to love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What, what, look, look. When are we going to get off of this thing that we have to make God save us and love us? Now, let me wreck you. Let me wreck you. My whole Christian life, five minutes. Y'all all right? Okay, don't leave. <laughs> okay. My whole Christian life, and maybe you've heard this too. I don't know why I'm talking to you, but maybe because I feel a little insecure and I need some motherly help. I'm easily mothered. Look, I've been preaching here for 24 years. This woman has known me for 20. She watched me grow up. She's seen me through the dark times, difficult times. Love my skinny butt anyway. Amen? Still got the microphone 24 years later. I don't know if I'm doing better or worse. I don't know. Just hang in there. But my whole Christian life, you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you love? No, no, I'm not asking you. That's what they used to ask. You love Jesus? You love Jesus? You love Jesus? You love Jesus? Because you know what? If you love Jesus, you'll keep his commandments. If you love him, you'll keep it. And you know what? The reason why you didn't keep his commandments is because you didn't love him enough and all that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The Bible says in this is love, not that you loved him, but that you received his love for you. Then when you receive his love, believe his love, you'll behave his commandments. Amen. We think, whoa, whoa, whoa. We think if we do his commandments, we're telling him we love him. When we receive his love, we automatically reflex. Boom. It's a reflex like a rubber hammer on your knee. knee boom. Pew. If you love me, if you receive my love for you, You'll automatically do my behave my commandments. We're tr we got it backwards. We're trying to behave to show him we love him, and he's trying to get us to love him, to receive his love for us, and then it will automatically behave. So this is where we get all messed up. Okay, I'm almost done. Stay with me, please. Did I mention not to leave? No, I know how Jubilee folk is. They'd be like, I got to go, man. I don't care. He raised three people from the dead. I'm almost not going to stick around for the fourth one. You know, I got to go. 
Look real quick at Romans 5. I'm done. Two more scriptures and then I'm out. It says, therefore, 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, not law, not works, what justified us? Believing, not behaving. Justified, justified, never sin is not a result of never sinning. It's a result of what Jesus has done and that we have the peace of God because we made peace with God because Jesus made peace for us. We have peace with God through Jesus, through whom also, we don't just have peace with God, but we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Look at me. What are you standing in right now? Grace. Who introduced you to it? Jesus. How did it get activated? You believed it. You received it. Now you stand in it. His grace. His grace. Now let me finish with this. Praise the Lord. Come on, Cindy or somebody. 2 Corinthians 5, 15. And Jesus died for everybody so that they who live no longer live for themselves. Look at me, look at me. Everybody say, it's all about him and not about me. That those who live might not long, any longer live for themselves, but live for him. Because he already did it. See, this is what we think. Jesus hung on the cross with the last words he said was, it's finished. This is what we think. It's half finished. Almost finished. I, did, I got it started, now y'all finish it. Remember Paul said to the Galatians, who bewitched you that what began as an operation of the spirit, you're gonna perfect through the arm of your flesh? Who bewitched you? You are free. If you're not living free, it's because you haven't attached your belief to the freedom that's already yours. All of the promises of God are already yes and amen in him. You're already blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. What unlocks it is it doesn't, it doesn't happen when you believe it. You just experience it when you believe it. Amen. What do you need today? It's all already yours. Do you know there's 7,000 promises deposited on the inside of you? When you got born again, 7,000 promises got deposited. And if you believe it, it'll activate them. Inside of you right now is every solution to every problem. It's in you if you believe, the Bible says. His power is towards you if you believe. Not if you do. Not if you're perfect. Not if you're all Catholic. Not if you're all, you know, guilted out. If you believe that he did it. It's in you right now, man. It's in you, dog. It's in you, sis. It doesn't get in you because you believe it. It's activated in you when you believe it. It's already there. Why are you tripping? Go live free. His burden's easy, his yoke's light. You're more than a conqueror, why? Because he already conquered, so you're more than a conqueror. You don't have to conquer anything. You're more than a conqueror, why? It's already been conquered. Now you're more than a conqueror. Amen. Well, what are you trying to conquer? That which has already been conquered? You're already more than that. Why are we living under what's been achieved for us? It's all about him. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. The author and the finisher of faith. Believe. Receive. Just sit there and let him wash your feet. He don't need you to do nothing for him. He's God. You're working for Jesus? No. I'm resting in Jesus. 
He already did the work. He don't want me to work. He wants me to rest in the finished work. Hello? Was this good today? Amen. Tonight, please no one leave. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about the five mindsets that cause us to miss this and get all into works and losing our rest. So come tonight at 6. We'll be in the urgency building. Come casual, and I'm going to break it off for you. You're going to love tonight. I'm not trying to get you back because I have some ego thing. I want to get the rest of this to you. Amen? Amen? If I'm going to be here, match my efforts. I'm older than you. I'm still sexy at 60, though. Okay, anyway. I I'm lying. I'm lying from the pulpit. Forgive me, Jesus. Okay, so look. Now, this is the time where we would usually receive an offering for my ministry. Listen to me. I want us to appreciate our pastor. I really want us to. This man means so much to so many. And if we approach God with appreciation and we're created in the image of God, let's appreciate Pastor Dick. I want him to come back and he told me, I don't want you to do this anymore. I said, I'm not, I'm not listening to you. He goes, Steve, you know, come on, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. Then don't come. Because it's honor. We give honor to whom honor is due. You don't, I'm not going to deprive you. I'm going to deprive myself of some offering. So what? But I'm not going to deprive you of an opportunity to send a message once a year to our pastor. Now, if you're new here and you don't really even know Dick Burnell and, and you're like, what? I, I don't, I, what is he doing? I, what? It's okay. I'm not talking to you. So you don't talk about me. Like, what's he do on Yelp? What's he doing? Like, don't do that. People got saved. You heard a good word. Now we can give to our pastor. As many as can do something great. Give a thousand bucks. Give 500. Give, give a dollar. It doesn't matter. But give thanks. Give appreciation. Amen. Ushers, station yourselves. Distribute envelopes. Make your, make your checks out to Jubilee. You could do it on the, on the, on the, on the app. You could text to give. Every single penny is going to pastor. Every single penny. Let's bless him. Don't you agree that's a good idea? Amen. Next time I come, you can give, you can give me an offering. But this time, I want to give to pastor. And let's just do something significant and really bless this man of God. Amen. Everybody do something. Please no one leave until the service is dismissed. Come on, if the Warriors were, were in overtime, you wouldn't leave. So Hage is in overtime. I'm better than Steph. Come on, somebody. What you talking about, Willis? Amen. Let, ushers, please wait on the people. Lord, bless this offering. Bless those who give. Lord, bless our pastor. Bless our man of God. Lord, let this be a significant, sacrificial, awesome gift to a general in the body of Christ. We come with thanksgiving, and with thanksgiving we give. Thanksgiving. Not thanks-taking, thanksgiving. In Jesus' name.